and it feels like I'm it feels like I'm taking two steps back after Jan's very I loved your presentation I just have to say that and uh, Sara Rigare sends, sends her best wishes <laughs> she's She's a member of my my research group, so I texted her a picture that you're you're online again, Sara. <laughs> she was very happy about that. Um, so I will go back a bit in time, and I will talk about um, how Swedish citizens gained access to their electronic health records. And I think that that's a. Um, I would much rather talk about uh, patient contributed data <laughs> as well. But I think that we also have quite a bit of work left to do to make sure that everyone across Europe and globally actually have access to their health records data uh, as a foundation for being able to contribute um, with, for example, finding errors and all the important things that Jan talked about. So <clears throat> let me take you back in time a little bit. And I, I will um, I will try to talk about this more from an international perspective. Uh, there are so many things happening. We've already heard about the European health data space. We also know that there is legislation now in the US that makes it um, um, illegal to not give patients access to their medical records. You can have uh, strict fines um, if you if you prohibit patients from, from having access to their records. So there is a lot of things happening and a lot of things changing globally, but I will start in Sweden and I will talk a little bit. We have a, a long uh, research collaboration in Sweden in a, a research consortium called DOME. Um, and uh, so if you want to find out more about the type of research we are doing in Sweden, you can visit that website, which is there. Uh, and the DOME Research Consortium has sort of followed the implementation of patients' online record access since it started in Sweden. And uh, as Rada already mentioned, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary last year, but it actually started much sooner than that. So already in 1997, the first pilot um, was taking place in Sweden, where there was one GP in uh, region Uppsala who wanted to give his 500 patients access to their medical records online. And he worked together with the region. It was um, worked very well. They set up the technical solution. The patients gained access to their medical records. And the region decided that this was such a successful uh, pilot. They wanted to implement it more broadly in the region. But when they decided to do so, the data inspection board um, one of the Swedish authorities um, raised a red flag and said, you can't do this, it's illegal. And the legislation at the time in Sweden said that in order to have direct, you had, as a patient, you had since the 70s, uh, the right to access your record on paper. But you weren't allowed to have direct access to the, to the record because if you, as, as you do online, because in order to have that in the current in the legislation at the time, you had to be employed by a healthcare provider. So back to the drawing board, um, lots of discussions, of course, is this really right? Shouldn't patients be allowed to have access to their records also online? And uh, it resulted in changes to the legislation. And in 2008, we, we had a new law, the new Patient Data Act, which allowed patients to have access to their records. It doesn't mandate having access to the record. It doesn't say that you have to give patients online access, but it says you're, it's okay to do so. And in 2012, Frieden and Uppsala then went live with giving all of their, um, all of the citizens or all of the patients who had received care in the region could then access their records online. And I know that because I was on vacation in Thailand and I had to, <laughs> I had to leave the pool area and go up to my hotel room and log in and read my records online and tweet about it, of course. Um, so that's how we know that it was in November 2012. Anyway, that was just one region in, in Uppsala. And um, um, it then took a few more years before um, everyone in Sweden had online access to their records. So the the Uppsala solution was very much directly connected to the electronic health record system used in Uppsala at the time. Um, 
But of course, it caused quite a lot of uh, interest from other regions um, and uh, from other patients, nonetheless. And in 2014, the local Uppsala solution was moved to a national health information exchange platform. So we don't actually have one record system in Sweden. There are many used in the different regions. But this, um, this interoperability platform uh, connects with the different electronic health record systems. So for me as a patient, I log in through the national patient portal and it looks like it's just one electronic health record system throughout Sweden. It's in fact not, but um, uh, we're quite proud <laughs> that we made it, made one entry point for all. So if I happen to move to a different region or I seek healthcare from a different healthcare provider, my data will still come into my online record as if it's one system. So more regions started connecting. There were regular framework, regulatory frameworks in place, put in place. And in 2018, all regions in Sweden, we have 21, um, were online with their record systems. Um, but we celebrated 10 years anyway, because we felt that <laughs> Uppsala was a big step. Um, this was, however, not uncontroversial. There was um, a lot of uh, debate and discussion. Um, clinicians were not super pleased. I'll get back to that. Um, this is what the national patient portal in Sweden looks like. It's in Swedish, but uh, I used Google Translate. So to give you a, a bit of help. Uh, it's called 1177, and that's because it's the same phone number that you can also call if you want advice from a nurse. So it's a number that most Swedes were very familiar with. This is how you contact healthcare. Um, this patient portal has, um, you don't have to log in or anything. There's lots of information you can find here about healthcare providers, about symptoms, treatments, etc. And as you can see uh, from the data here, the, it has had a very steady sort of usage pattern where it, the use number of users sort of peak in January, February when we have the flu season in Sweden, and then it drops in summer when we are relaxing in the sun and don't have to worry too much about being sick. So we've seen that pattern over the years and how the uptake has also increased from when the National Patient Portal was launched in 2013. Slow but steady increase in use until 2020 when um, things got a bit crazy and it really has um, uh, shown the importance of having this kind of um, online platform for, for patients to find trustworthy information. And as you can see, the visits to the, the National Patient Portal more than doubled um, over two years. Um, you can also log in. You use a uh, um, two-factor authentication. We call it the bank ID because you usually get it from your bank. But when you log into the, the National Patient Portal, you can find lots of um, interactive services. So you can book appointments or um, um, send secure messaging with your healthcare providers, or you can read your medical records. Uh, and of course, um, this um, use of these logged in services are, have also increased quite a lot. Um, so we have now have more than 9.4 million accounts to these people who have actually at one point or another logged in to use these services, and which is quite good considering that we're roughly 10 million people in Sweden. Uh, I have double checked though, the statistics are not updated when someone dies or leaves the country. So we will soon have more accounts than we have citizens in Sweden. And then I'll probably stop reporting this number, but for now I'll keep doing it. And if we look at the numbers of how many people actually log in, that has also more than doubled. So in January, 2022, it was 4.3 million people who logged in during that month. And there were over 25 million logins in total. So quite a lot of usage of these um, national services. You can access your medical records. It's called Kunalen. Uh, Kunalen means medical record in Swedish. Uh, and um, when you do so, you can access your notes, your medica prescribed medications, lab results, 
referrals and other things. You don't have access to x-ray images, um, but that's, um, and some pathology results, I think you might not have access to as well. It looks a little bit different because since we have these 21 regions, each region or healthcare provider can also choose a little bit what information they make publicly available or make available to patients on the portal. So it might vary a little bit depending on where you have received healthcare. But the aim is that everyone should have access to all of their information as soon as possible. We're not quite there yet, I might add. Again, we've seen a rapid increase in uh, users of this record. So in total, more than 6.5 million people have logged in to access their records online. And as you can see, we see a, a similar increase here in, in 2020 of, uh, of use, um, both new users and number of logins. And part of this was because when you got your COVID tests, you, um, you got the test results through the record. So it was quite, um, quite a, a frequently used uh, e-health service. We are seeing now a little bit of a drop, drop again. So the use is going down a little bit this year, uh, but we're still on quite high levels of usage, higher than before the pandemic. And I think it is that a lot of new users have found these services and um, seen the benefit of using them. As I said, as I mentioned, this was um, not an uncontroversial decision to give patients online access to their medical records. And this is part of what the Dome Research Consortium has researched <laughs> over the past 10 years. Um, clinicians, especially physicians, uh, were quite worried beforehand uh, and expressed quite strong concerns about giving patients access to their electronic health records. So these slides, the next three slides, I've, I borrowed from some colleagues of mine, Hanif Ereshepi and Christiane Grönlo, who were both uh, active in the, in the Dome Consortium. Um, and they summarized a little bit what uh, clinicians feared beforehand and what patients experienced when they actually gained access. So one of these uh, things that clinicians worried a lot about was anxiety, that patients would uh, receive bad news, that they would see um, suspected diagnosis, that they wouldn't understand medical terms, that they would read before they had a visit with the physician. And this does happen. We, we, we do have patients who, who read their notes and their test results before seeing their clinician. Um, what we have seen from studies with patients is that um, quite a few, most patients still want to have bad news by being informed in person by their clinicians, but a growing number actually says that they prefer to read through the record rather than waiting uh, to hear from a clinician. We did, um, Hanifa did a, a, an interview study with the cancer patients where um, many of them actually expressed that they preferred to read bad news beforehand so that they could prepare uh, their questions and they didn't have to sit in the meeting and be in shock and deal with all these emotions and not remember anything that the clinician said. But the main thing is that most patients want to have the choice on how to receive news. So whether you want to wait or not, most patients prefer to choose that themselves. Uh, another worry from clinicians was that the workload would increase, that um, there would be more phone calls, more questions, that patients would demand changes or inaccuracies or errors, and that they would have to change the way they wrote in the record. Patients didn't feel like they, uh, most patients that has been interviewed or surveyed um, don't really feel like contacting healthcare unnecessarily. Either they wait until they have their next visit um, or they, um, um, they talk to someone else, a friend, a relative, someone who has more clinical uh, knowledge than they do. Most patients don't want to be a burden. Um, when, we, when it comes to errors and, and inaccuracies, I think that we need to, well, for, 
what we've seen in our studies is that yes, patients are reluctant to point that out for several reasons. <laughs> I think one is that they don't want to be a, the difficult patient, but also that there are very few means to actually ask for these kind of changes and requests. We have seen in studies that patients do find quite a lot of errors in Swedish records as well as in, in the studies done in the US, but there are no really good ways of making the corrections or commenting on these things. There used to be, a, um, which I see as more of a problem than patients asking to have their records corrected. Um, there used to be a function in the Swedish um, online patient record uh, that you could comment on a note in the record, but it has actually been removed. And it wasn't designed and implemented in a very good way, so I understand why they removed it. But we do have a, a planned research project to look into how the function was used and how we can replace it with something better. Uh, clinicians also thought that patients wouldn't find uh, having access to the records useful, that they wouldn't understand it and they would only become worried by reading it. Um, whereas patients see, patients report massive uh, benefit from having access to the records. They use it as a memory aid um, to remember what was said at the meeting. Often patients only remember a fraction of what you discussed with your physician or, or other clinicians. Uh, so you want to go back and check. You also use it to, to make sure um, that there weren't any misunderstandings, that you understood what the clinicians said and that they understood what you said, that they actually heard you. Uh, you also use it to prepare for the next visit, uh, to get information in a timely manner, test results, for example. It, uh, many patients report that they feel more involved in, in decision-making and have an increased understanding of their health conditions. And studies in the US also indicate that patients do a better job of taking their medications, following their treatments plan when they actually have access to uh, the record and the notes in the record. So there seems to be a bit of a discrepancy between what clinicians expected beforehand and what patients actually uh, experience. And this is not unique to Sweden. We see this in most countries where uh, online record access is implemented, that there are a lot of concerns beforehand. Uh, but once it's implemented, it doesn't really, the sky doesn't fall. Um, uh, we see that now, for example, in England, as of the, there was a plan for all, um, for patients in England to gain automatic access to their GP notes as of 1st of November, uh, but this has been um, halted after strong objections from the Medical Association. Um, and um, it now looks like it won't go live today either, and we'll see what happens. But I think it's a pity that it's, uh, it's being delayed. Um, we wanted to, well, we do have quite a bit of I've mentioned that we do a lot of research in Sweden. We also have a lot of collaboration with researchers in the Nordic countries, uh, among other things through this project Nordi Health, which we have in, in collaboration with the researchers in Norway, um, Finland and Estonia. Um, we also know that uh, in Denmark and Iceland, you have similar national patient portals as we do have in, in these countries that I mentioned. And we have, um, we're, busy working on analysis of a, an international survey study that we've actually had that, in, that was published in the, on the patient portals in Sweden, Norway, Finland and Estonia all together. So we're very much looking forward to being able to report more results from there. So we feel like we have a fairly good idea of the Nordic countries and how their patient portals work. But we're very interested in what's happening in the rest of Europe as well and, uh, and globally when it comes to patients' access to their health data. And uh, as Rada also mentioned, we have this uh, EFMI, the European Federation of Medical Informatics. We have a working group called Citizen and Health Data. And we, earlier this year, we published uh, uh, an online survey. Very broadly, we spread it to, to all our sort of um, 
um, contacts, people that we thought might know um, what the situation is in their country. But we've also spread it more widely, asking questions about um, to what extent do patients in your country have online access to their medical records. Uh, so, so far we've had 74 responses, not a huge amount, but we see this as a first step to sort of um, to create a map or a picture of what the situation is like across uh, Europe and internationally. We've had responses from 22 countries overall and 18 of them were European countries. Um, so as you can see, there are still a few gray areas. Iceland and Denmark. I don't know if it's because we didn't include them in the Nordi Health project, but we hope to to we the, the survey remains open. So we hope that uh, that more people will help us fill out the gray areas on the map. Uh, we've asked questions about who has access to the records. Um, we asked about whether you can access your your record on paper, um, and the green. Uh, countries are um, where you have access, reported access, uh, and the gray, dark gray countries is where we get conflicting answers. So I know, for example, in Sweden that yes, you can request your record on paper, but it doesn't seem to be known to everyone uh, in Sweden, at least not the people answering our survey. Um, when we asked about online access, we also see that. There are a lot of countries where you do have online access to your records, and we didn't we didn't say that it specified that it had to be national uh, access. We asked about any access online, and we again we have somewhat inconsistent answers uh, from people. So there seems to be some. Uh, not everyone is well aware or has the same picture of whether you do have online access to your records or not. Um. According to the, to the current data that we have, we've identified 11 countries in Europe where you can access your records online. We also asked about access law, and we have, uh, again, 11 countries where people responding to our survey reported that, yes, uh, there is a legal obligation to give patients access to their records. Uh, but we don't know more details about that, whether the law is allowing patients to have access as it does in Sweden, or if it's mandating uh, that patients should have access to their record. And does it also include online access? So lots of, um, lots of uh, fu future questions to ask here. Uh, what information do people have access to? The most common thing seems to be medications and prescription lists, but also lab results and test results, immunization records and uh, diagnosis and conditions. Diagnostic imaging seems to be very um, less commonly available. We asked specifically about the notes in the record um, and as you can see primary care notes and secondary care notes that are not from psychiatric care are the most frequently accessible to patients. Uh, psychiatric Notes from secondary psychiatric care seems to be less available, uh, as is social care records. Uh, and quite a few also reported that they don't have, they have record access, but they don't have access to notes. Or they don't know whether they have access to notes. So a bit fragmented here. And it's, um, it's always a discussion about what's included in the record. We also asked about patient input connecting back to the patient uh, contributed data. Can patients enter information and somehow, or somehow contribute with information to their online health record? Some answered yes, but the majority, the vast majority says no. We'll need to, to um, further explore this. And as, as Jan already talked about, there are so many different forms of, of data that patients could contribute with. And that was just the summary of, of our current status of mapping out the uh, record access across Europe. And it's not too late to help. So if you, if you feel like we have the wrong information in our results, please scan the code and, 
and, uh, and uh, give us more data to work with. Um, we do see in our research, and I think that I am running out of time, so I'll be very quickly. We do see quite a lot of implementation challenges that are recurring across contexts. Um, characteristics of the intervention. So how do we actually design patient access to health records? Uh, how is the portal design? Is it usable for, um, we, we often see usability issues. What information do you have access to? Who decides whether you have access? And how do you gain access? One of these things that is now being discussed in England, for example, the technology has been there before, but you had to apply to your GP to gain access, which was quite a, a difficult process and uh, has been a barrier, I think, for adoption. Uh, do we reach all patients? What's the status of, of um, digital or e-health literacy? What about vulnerable groups? Uh, is there resistance from healthcare professionals? Quite often. Um, what's the context in which the intervention will be implemented and used? What's the infrastructure? What's the laws and regulations? That was one of the barriers in Sweden, for example. Are there incentives in place or uh, hindering patient online access? And how do, we, um, uh, how do we implement the intervention? Education, support from leadership, etc. cetera. So lots of challenges there. And what's next to research? Well, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I use the patient generated data. I'll change it to patient contributed data and input into the record. I think this is one of the key things that will happen in the future. Mental health is one of the areas that will also, so psychiatry records and access to those. This is one of the areas where patients are often excluded from having access to the record. Proxy access is another important area. We don't currently in Sweden allow proxy access other than uh, um, for parents to children up till the age of 13. Uh, and that's a, an area where I think that there is a lot of room for improvement as well. And patient access as a safety function, talking about errors, but also explore non-readers' views. Why do some patients choose not to read their records? Most of the research we've done to date has been focusing on the experiences of patients who actually read their records. So lots of things left to research. And as Radha mentioned, we do have started, we want to expand this international collaboration. So we launched a few weeks ago the HEDA, health data program, uh, where we want to uh, focus on further international re research around these issues, not just record access, but also patient contributed data and, and how do we uh, handle our health data in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria, for this nice and interesting uh, introduction and good luck of your future research. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so first a question from Rita. Is Sweden's portal accessible on mobile devices or web-based? Sorry? Is Sweden's portal accessible on mobile devices or yes. only web-based? Okay. No, thanks. it's accessible on mobile devices as well. Okay. Yes, it's, uh... Second. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. second question from Parapas. Uh, 